and call this meeting to order. Welcome to our December 16th Planning Commission meeting, and if everybody could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. We have roll call, please. Commissioner Bergman? Present. Commissioner Gutierrez? Present. Commissioner Marsters? Present. Vice Chair Silberman? Present. And Chair Harper Pedersen? Present. Thank you. Uh, public comment. Public comment is limited to items that are not on the listed agenda. Is anybody out here, uh, excuse me, is anybody here to speak tonight on items that are not on the agenda? No? Okay, seeing nobody, we will go ahead and move on to the approval of the minutes. Uh, we are going to look at our November 18th, 2013 minutes. Does anybody have any changes or additions to the minutes? Um, there is a portion on page three mm -hmm. um, towards the bottom. It's the third to last paragraph, and it starts Vice Chair Silberman. Uh, I believe those uh, comments were made by uh, Commissioner Marsters, and that, all of them in that paragraph, actually. Okay, is that, does that sound right? Okay. Um, Lisa, if that could be, if that change can be noted. Okay. Are there any other changes or additions to the November 18th minutes? Okay, seeing none, may I entertain a motion, please? Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is our public hearing. Uh, since I see a lot of new faces in the crowd, I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit about the public hearing. Staff is going to present a re report on the history and the physical features uh, of the application, and then the um, then they're going to follow with their staff recommendations. At that point, the applicant may also make a presentation. Thereafter, interested members of the community may come up and speak on the proposal, and please fill out a speaker card located closest to the door. When all interested parties have had the opportunity to be heard, the hearing will be closed and no further discussion from the floor can be held. The Commission will then consider evidence and make our recommendation. If you challenge a public hearing item in court, you may be limited to raising only those items uh, that you or somebody else has raised at public hearing or, um, or that has been uh, submitted in written correspondence to the City prior to public hearing. Okay, and if you can hand your speaker card to staff, they will go ahead and pass those forward. And that, uh, please speak into the microphone with your name and address, and that will help the staff prepare the minutes. Our first item on the agenda is 596 Club Drive, and we are considering a request for a tentative map, grading, and dirt hall certificate and design review approval. Um, General President Patterson, I need to recuse myself from this, from 596 Club, because of my affiliation with the Homeowners Association. Great, thank you, Shannon. Good evening, Commissioner. Stephanie Bertolo Davis, Senior Planner. Tonight you are being asked to consider a project located at 596 Club Drive. The project is threefold, or three entitlements requested. First one being a tentative parcel map for approval of the subdivision of this one existing lot into two lots. The second being a grading and dirt hall approval certificate to allow for earthwork at the site that exceeds 1,000 cubic yards in volume. Lastly, design review approval for the construction of two new single family homes on the two new parcels to be created. A uh, brief description of the site, aerial photograph, the subject site outlined in yellow with the star. The site itself is a little less than 25,000 square feet in area. It's located at the corner of Club and Crestview Drives. <clears throat> Both the general plan land use designation as well as the zoning district designation cite this as a single family low density parcel. A bit more detail on the project request itself. As I mentioned, it is threefold. All three entitlements do require the Planning Commission review and approval. 
Um, the proposed subdivision of the existing parcel into two newly configured parcels are described in the project documents as Lot A, which is proposed to be subdivided at 10,000 square feet, and Lot B, the larger, at 14,723 square feet. Um, as I mentioned, the earthwork associated with the construction of the two new single-family homes proposed to be built on both sites cumulatively results in a volume of 1,465 cubic yards. Of that total, 280 of it will remain on site as fill, um, and the remaining 1,185 cubic yards would be hauled off site. <clears throat> the demolition of the existing single family home on the parcel and the construction of two new homes results on lot A, the 10,000 square foot lot, a new two story little over 4,000 square foot home with the driveway for this property um, accessed off of Crestview Drive, but the front of the home oriented towards Club Drive. The larger lot proposed as lot B has a little less than 6,000 square foot home. This includes a little over 1,000 square foot garage basement. Um, both the driveway and the front of the home of this parcel is oriented towards Club Drive. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, getting into the first requested entitlement, which is approval of a tentative parcel map associated with the subdivision of the lot. Uh, tentative parcel maps depict the design and improvements of a proposed subdivision. These are subject to regulations of both the city's subdivision ordinance as well as the state subdivision map act law. Uh, Post-approval by the Planning Commission and prior to finaling of the project um, at the building permit stage, a final map would be recorded, approved by the City Council, um, fi uh, uh, recorded at the San Mateo County Recorder's Office. Uh, the design of the lots in terms of their area, their depth, their width, percent to remain ungraded do comply with the City's local subdivision requirements. Um, based on their slope, as well as the use of single-family homes at a low density um, as required by the city zoning ordinance. All the city departments have reviewed the request for subdivision and determined that all public services can be served to two lots. Uh, the lot configurations are consistent with the established lot patterns in the neighborhood. And for these reasons, um, and as specified in further detail in the staff report, it's found that the project is able to meet the 10 required findings in order for a tentative parcel map uh, to be granted. Um, two related tentative parcel map um, typos in the staff report and the entitlements I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, first would be on page 8 of the staff report. Re required finding number 7. <clears throat> the word not was omitted. It should read the design of the subdivision or proposed improvements are not likely to cause substantial environmental damage or substantially avoidable injury to fish, wildlife, or their habitat. Um, secondly, in attachment two, which is the grading and dirt hall, excuse me, attachment one, the tentative parcel map certificate, um, all reference to the Belmont San Carlos Fire Department should strike reference to the word Belmont. The second requested entitlement is the grading and dirt hall certificate. Um, again, the volumes broken down as I specified previously. Um, specifically of the 1,185 cubic yards to be hauled off site, it's anticipated that trucks at a 10 cubic yard capacity would accommodate this project. That results in approximately um, uh, 120 truck trips. The applicant estimates that this work would be completed in about one month's worth of time. The dirt hall route as required by the city subdivision, or excuse me, the city's municipal code has been established by the city engineer, both for empty trucks going to the site as well as full trucks leaving the site. There's one required finding the planning commission needs to make in order to grant a dirt, grading and dirt hall certificate. Um, the reasons as specified and as um, detailed in the staff report, it is found that the project um, would be able to meet this required finding. Uh, one more point I would like to make as well, um, the municipal code does 
prohibit grading activities between the months of October 15th and April 15th of every year. Um, so no work could begin at this site for the earthwork specifically um, unless the city engineer was to approve it otherwise. And how, uh, so they, the applicant would then submit a request um, if they wanted to do work during a dry spell before the 15th? They would submit that request um, simultaneous with their building permit plans. And depending on the nature, specific nature of the work, the city engineer has the authority to allow e even small components of the overall grading work to be conducted. Right. Thank you, Stephanie. <coughs> Uh, the last requested entitlement is for design review approval to allow for the construction of the two new single family homes. This includes their proposed landscaping plans as well. Um, before getting into the specifics of the design review findings, a little bit of background as it relates to the design review for this project. Um, <clears throat> two study sessions have been conducted by the RDRC or the city's residential design review committee. November of 2012, as well as February of this year. Um, there have been six primary concerns expressed um, by both the neighbors and the RDRC committee. The plans that are being presented to you tonight have attempted to address those six concerns, which I'll get into now. Uh, the first item was in regards to the safety and well-being of existing trees and vegetation not on the subject site but located to the rear of what's called Lot B or proposed Lot B along Trillium Lane. This photograph shows the trees that I made mention of. This is Trillium Lane here. This is the subject site and this is approximately the rear shared property or the rear shared, the rear property line of Lot B. <clears throat> The post the RDRC study sessions, um, staff has asked the city arborist to perform a site inspection of the property, inspect the trees along Trillium Lane, um, and review the plans as proposed. And since that point, the city arborist has developed protection measures, which are, have been incorporated as draft approval conditions in the code compliance certificate. He's also determined that the proposed plans, as they are shown and presented tonight, would not pose any long-term impacts uh, to the trees as it relates to construction. The second item on which concern was expressed at these study sessions was for revised landscaping for Lot A, and that's a lot farther up towards Crestview Drive. Excuse me. Yes, Crestview Drive. Um, as it related to some privacy, privacy concerns to the adjacent neighbor um, to the north at 289 Crestview. And the applicant has since revised the landscaping plans to add greater landscaping components, uh, added some more trees at a larger planting size, a 24-inch box size. Um, the third item had to do with concern of traffic and vehicular safety at the intersections of Trillium Lane and Club Drive, as well as Club Drive and Crestview. Um, specifically as it related to the proposed driveway access points for both Lot A and Lot B. Um, the city's public works department has reviewed the plans as proposed. Uh, it is their professional opinion that the driveway locations and subsequent corresponding distances from the intersections I just mentioned and the proposed driveway locations uh, are sufficient so as not to pose any significant traffic or circulation issues. Um, the Public Works Department has also stated that the existing sidewalk and street cross crosswalk improvements that are located at Club and Crestview Drive have been installed to industry standards. The fourth of the six items of concern expressed had to do with the construction staging and parking plan during the construction activities for both the two new homes. <coughs> Excuse me. And since then, the applicant has submitted a um, construction parking and staging plan on plan that um, shows where the vehicles and materials would be stored during construction, all of which would be to occur on site. Um, a condition has been added to the draft code compliance certificate um, requiring a bit more detail in the narrative prior to building permit issuance. 
The fifth concern or question expressed had to do with the proposed window locations, specifically of um, lot A and lot B to their, their nearest existing neighbors, both multifamily and single family homes. Um, unfortunately, a bit hard to see in this rendering, but it's included in the plan packet. Um, the applicant that's um, since submitted a view study both on plan and in elevation. What you see here is the elevation. This makes out the outline of proposed home A, this proposed lot B, and home B, um, and the corresponding distances between the nearest windows for home here we go, B and A. Those distances um, are between about 110 to 115 feet to the nearest windows at the, the Trillium Lane frontage. Um, that, in combination with the existing landscaping to remain, be protected, as well as the new landscaping to be proposed, will also help to serve as a screening mechanism between the existing homes and those proposed at the subject site. And the last item of um, question as it came out of the RDRC study sessions to do with the proposed uh, wood retaining wall that effectively follows the rear and side boundary of lot B, the one go, further down here. There's a wood retaining wall proposed for almost the entire property boundary at the rear and up a bit towards um, Club Drive. So the applicant has since provided additional information on that wall. Um, it is proposed to be a landscaping wall between two to three feet tall, um, finished with wood. The applicant's landscape architect has prepared a corresponding landscape and irrigation plan that shows that that wall will effectively be screened once the proposed vegetation is um, grown at maturity. Staff also had the city's building official take a look at the proposed plans, and as the wall is proposed in its current state, um, he's determined that that wall would be exempt from any permit review, but should those construction details change the point of building permit submittal, it would require re-review um, and could be required to be engineered if taller than four feet. <coughs> So with that, um, a bit of detail on the proposed new homes at lot A and lot B. Lot A, the smaller of the two lots, proposes a two-story home, a little over 4,000 square feet in area. Lot B, the larger of the two, larger home at a little less than 6,000 square feet. This is the home that has the, the three levels, the lowest level being um, the garage on a defined basement. These are renderings of the two proposed new homes. This home here being lot A, this one being lot B. Where the cursor is is approximately the intersection of Club and Crestview Drive, so this is a rendering from Club Drive. This rendering down here is the rear of the lot B house. Um, as would be viewed from Trillium Lane. I also have the flat elevation drawings, um, but I will keep the slides here for discussion purposes, but we can go back to the flat drawings um, if you wish. Thank you. So both homes do meet the city's uh, zoning development standards as it pertains to height, lot coverage, setbacks, landscaping, parking areas. Um, beginning with the house on lot A, um, it's a two-story home that was oriented on the site in the attempts to reduce its visual prominence as much as possible and as per the applicant, uh, much of which resulted from, a, from conversations with the adjacent um, neighbor on Crestview Drive. Um, the design is found to be compatible with the existing architectural neighborhood styles. It has a comprehensive landscaping plan which both assists to mitigate the visual impact of the new home. Um, and create an overall design aesthetic that ties in with this type of loosely described as Mediterranean architecture and that that's existing in the neighborhood. Um, 
The home would be finished in a variety of high quality materials, including stucco, stone, iron. Uh, the multicolored concrete tiled roof also complements this Mediterranean type design. There are two existing heritage oak trees on this site. Um, and have shown maybe here in the rendering, but better on plan view, that would remain. Moving on to lot, the house on lot B. <clears throat> this is again the larger home um, that will appear more as a two-story split level from the public right-of-way here along Club Drive and at the rear a two-story as well. Um, given the way that the home has been proposed to be situated on the site in relation to the existing natural topography, which has a slight downslope towards Trillium Lane. Uh, the floor levels and wall lines are set back and staggered. Window treatments added on all facades in the attempt to follow the natural topography I was just describing and reduce the overall bulk and mass. Uh, the home, this home was oriented in the attempt to be comparable in terms of lineal um, elevation lengths relative to its most um, closest abutting neighbors, which are both multifamily structures as well as single family structures. Um, again, this overall Mediterranean style is complementary to the home on Lot A with attempts to make it different enough that it um, is <coughs> not cookie cutter, so to speak. In terms of design review approval, uh, the commission is required to meet, make five required findings in order to grant such. Um, as outlined in the staff report and as conditioned in the draft code compliance certificate, the required findings are found to be met by the proposal for each of the two new homes proposed. The analysis goes into depth separately for both Lot A and Lot B. Uh, public outreach and comment um, required notice was sent to property owners of 300 feet, 300 feet of the site as well as to homes that abut on the established dirt hall route um, minus arterial streets, busier, heavier streets such as Crestview Drive, Holly, San Carlos Avenue. Um, no comments or questions were directed to staff at the point of tonight's meeting with the exception of a conversation that I had with the adjacent property owner at 289 Crestview Drive um, related to related but independent lot line adjustment application mm -hmm. that was approved administratively at the staff level between his property and what's referred to as lot A. Um, this lot line adjustment approval allows this subdivision to meet the minimum area requirements for the tentative map certificate that I described earlier. Uh, the applicant did conduct their own public outreach as well with um, primarily through the mailing out of items provided their contact information. I do believe he said conversations with several of the neighbors over the course of the last several years as this project has developed. Um, and stated their attempts to address the concerns as they have been expressed to him. So with that, staff does recommend that the Planning Commission grant a tentative parcel map, grading and dirt hall certificate, and design review, design review approval to allow for the subdivision of the existing parcel to two parcels, the construction of one new single family home on each of the resulting new lots created at 596 Club Drive. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions the commission may have. The architect is here as well as the landscape architect um, and the engineer, I believe, to answer any specific questions that the commission may have of them. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Stephanie at this point before I ask if the application or if the applicant <coughs> can speak? Just yeah. one Stephanie. quick question, Stephanie. So uh, I know there's been a concern about the retaining walls and the slope of that that property um, on the back side. Um, what happens if something happens? Who, I mean, who is responsible for fixing it? Is it, is it the engineer? Is it the property owner? If that property starts to slide a little bit, 
and those retaining walls don't hold, who who is the person who's ultimately responsible for taking care of that? The property owner. The property owner. And that's as part of the the approval of the project that makes the individual responsible. That's correct. But in, in a related point that I'd like to make that I didn't verbalize previously is that we've staff has asked both the city engineer as well as the city geologist. There has been a preliminary geotechnical report prepared for the property and it is in their professional opinions that the details as they are proposed have proved to be sufficient in terms of the site's feasibility at the construction aspects as they are proposed. And given, again, that the nature of these landscaping retaining walls, um, the walls are not subject to permit. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Stephanie at this point? No? Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Would the applicant like to come up and speak? Hi, my name is Bill Pashlinski. I'm the architect. It's been a long road for us. We started the project in 2007. We do have the full team here. I think Stephanie's done a terrific job in uh, describing and really selling the project tonight. I'm really incredibly impressed. I've never heard anybody do as thorough a job in any of the previous planning commissions that I've done, and I've been an architect for quite a while. I'm going to address just the one issue that's been brought up about the wall. The site is a very, for compared to what I do, and I do work in, throughout the Bay Area, San Francisco, I, a lot of the properties left, it's just the nature of the properties left that are undeveloped tend to be on fairly steep hillsides. This, I would not consider, uh, is, is a pretty gentle slope, you know, up there. It's, it's a very gradual grade. Uh, we did bring a structural engineer with us tonight if you have any concerns. The wall is of such... One, we did prepare a geological survey. When you do surveys, you can see soil conditions. If there's something unstable with the strata, we see nothing here that, that seems out of the uh, ordinary. We certainly, you know, for our own liability and our own conscience, really want to make sure any project is safe and sound. We tend to over-design these retaining walls two or three or four times over, you know, any requirement. I think that uh, in the design of retaining walls, we've come a long way because we, you know, we've had to. But um, this is really a, a, a low, I want to say low priority, but it is a minimal retaining wall. Most of it's two feet. Uh, at parts of it, maybe it goes up to, you know, three feet. Um, I, one, it's unlikely it's going to fail. Two, that the nearness to anybody, I believe, on that one drawing I did, is but I, I think from the sh from Trillium Street we're a good 30 or 40 feet. We don't expect anything to fail. We're certainly not going to design it that way. But I, I um, do not think that comparably that it, it would be considered a major hazard. But certainly, if you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer. You always you know uh, have liability with these projects. And once again, I want to reiterate: you really want to make sure they're designed correctly from the very get-go. Does anybody have any questions for the applicant or his team at this point? No. One. Right. Okay. <laughs> Do you have your landscaper here with you? Uh, yeah. Can you come forward, please, to the microphone? Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Alita Truant. I'm the landscape designer who prepared the plans. Thank you. Um, so my question was, I went up and looked at the, at the lot and, um, on the back of, uh, house B, okay, that's a, a pretty sloping, um, uh, back and I'm not exactly sure how you're cutting into the, the property in order to, to, to build that, but, um, my concern was the houses that are on that I would say it's off Trillium Lane. Is it Trillium Street that's off Trillium Lane, or is that a, a technically a driveway? It looks like a private part of that homeowners association. In fact, I went out and made, um, I don't know the exact name, but I think yeah. you're right. It's Trillium Lane, and then I know the first left yeah. of Trillium you're talking about yes. that is at the base of that slope where there are some more of the houses or yes. condominiums or... And I was just worried about the the view from that house and especially from the second floor balcony 
of um, the back of House B down onto those houses. And I, and I looked for any landscaping that's sort of in the back there, and it looked like there's a perennial bed, but no trees or anything to really block the visual impact of that house on the um, on this on, the, uh, on that end on that end to, to speak to that I went back because of that concern that concern was raised I went back and did a, a survey of the existing trees on that slope mm -hmm. so those trees do not uh, belong to house B to the property owner however uh, their tr the homeowners association trillium homeowners association has planted several trees that are actually going to become quite large they're ash there are oaks, um, several trees. And so I think that, and we do have one uh, pretty large uh, tree uh, flanking the balcony there. Um, it's not directly in front, but it is, there is a large tree uh, off that balcony and you mean the one that looks like it's near the swimming pool? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, T T five. Okay. And but I think that um, those trees on that slope, uh, as they get more mature, because when I looked up, I went out there and I did that site. I think that those will actually uh, that are already existing will help. Uh, ameliorate and co cover that balcony. I don't think that that will be really too big an issue. Because I was concerned that the height of that balcony and those trees are going to take some years to actually get to the the level of that. And because of the downslope, my concern was that those trees may not get to the height. Whereas a tree or two in this back area here might actually. I don't think on the same. I don't level. think that's a problem. I when I went out to Trillium Lane to do this survey, I actually met with one of the owners who was on the um, landscape committee of the Homeowners Association, and he had told me, he showed me around and showed me that those he had planted, they had planted those trees, the ash, and the other trees up on that slope. And when I looked. The other issue is there are not many issue. There are not many windows. What okay. there mainly are, they're garages, and it's like roof. So there's not um, view windows from the homeowners' houses up towards that balcony. So I don't think it's a concern of those property those owners. Okay. I don't think th there are no windows because I actually stood on that lane with this gentleman and looked back up and it's pretty dense there's a lot of trees right under that uh, that perennial bed there's a lot of uh, trees um, flanking the property line there and all the way down the slope including some large ash is there a fence there no 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 plans for a fence just the low retaining wall at this point is there a fence around the swimming pool? No, there's an automatic uh, pool cover, the state of, the, which is acceptable by the Code of State of California. Yes, thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions for the landscape architect or the rest of the team? Thank no. you very thank much. You. And certainly if any questions come up, we can recall the team. At this point, then, I'd love to hear uh, public comment. I don't have any speaker cards in front of me. I'm curious if... If anybody was here to speak on Club Drive, okay. David, would you like to come on up? Thank you. Madam Chair and uh, members of the Planning Commission, you all know me <laughs> at this point. Uh, I happen to be the neighbor next door. Ah. So, uh, you know, as, in my pro density point of view on things, I'm actually proposing that uh, we approve this density increase next to my house. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, the piece of property that transfers is, is on my property. So I, I urge you to, to pass it. Uh, the architect has worked with me to try to uh, you know, ameliorate as many of the view issues as possible. It's not perfect, but it's, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with it. So. Great. Thank you very much, David. 
Okay, well then seeing no other speaker cards, I'd like to entertain a motion to uh, co close public comment and deliberate. Move to close public comment. Second. Mm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, well, at this point, then, um, does anybody have any comments or, or any statements at all about the deliberation? I know that at least two of us have been through the earlier stages, through the RDRC, um, with this project. And I have to say that I, I am really pleased um, that so many of the issues that have been brought up earlier in the process have been addressed uh, by, by the applicant. And that, that uh, bodes really well for the process. I'm just very pleased about that. And that's my only statement or comment at this point. OK. Well, if nobody has any comments or uh, deliberation, if I can entertain what looks like three motions. Uh, do we take these motions individually? I believe so. I'll start with the first one. Thank I move you. that the Planning Commission approve the request for a tentative map for the subdivision of one parcel into two parcels at 596 Club Drive based on the findings for the reasons incorporated in the staff report and as conditions in the tentative map certificate. May I get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. OK, thank you. Would somebody like to? Do you motion to? Do them all. I can do them all. Thank you, Scott. Um, I move that the Planning Commission approve the request for a grading and dirt hall certificate for grading and earthwork activities at approximately 1,745 1, cubic yards at 596 Club Drive based on the findings for the reasons incorporated in the staff report and as conditioned in the grading and dirt hall certificate. May I get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. And I move that the Planning Commission approves the request for design review for the construction of one new single family home on each of the resulting two new parcels at 596 Club Drive for the reasons incorporated in the staff report and as conditioned in the code compliance certificate. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you all very much. Great. I'd like to go ahead and move on to item B of our public hearing, 775 Industrial Road Environmental Review Design Review Grading and Dirt Hall Sign Plan Variance and Conditional Use Permit for the construction of a new automobile sales and repair facility. And I'd like to invite uh, Kim Shannon back up. I keep wanting Commissioner Shannon, Commissioner Bergman. I'm getting way too familiar. <laughs> yes, come on Thank you. I was wondering, could they be used these? Hey, rather than me recycling them, can they make any use of these? I feel like I want to run after them and give them this. This is so much paper. <laughs> give them mine, see if they can mine. Let your kids draw on the back. Hi. Good evening. Hi, Lisa. Um, as introduced, the item is uh, 775 Industrial Road, and the request is for environmental review, design review, grading and dirt hall, a sign plan, variance, as well as a conditional use permit for a new automobile sales and service facility. Uh, the subject site is a flag lot that's located just off of Industrial Road, and it backs up to Highway 101. The subject site is a little over 2.6 acres in area, and it was previously utilized by Praxair together with the front parcel and is currently just used for some vehicle storage. Uh, the applicant proposes to construct a new two-story, 44,000 square foot building for automobile sales and service. Um, the business hours are proposed as the sales showroom would be Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and Sundays they would operate from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., and the service department would be open daily from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, the first item is the grading and dirt hall. Um, as the subject site is located within the floodplain, San Carlos Municipal Code requires that the first floor of new construction be raised um, above the floodplain elevation. And as such, that's requiring uh, importing of 6,905 cubic yards of soil. Uh, the applicant has estimated that would be contained within 380 truckloads and the work would be completed within three to four weeks. 
Um, we have a haul route that's been approved by the city engineer and I actually got input from um, County of San Mateo Public Works Department that they are agreeable to this haul route. So they can access the site from 101 um, Britain to industrial and then depart industrial to Holly to 101. So it's a pretty straightforward haul route. Uh, just to give you an overview of the site plan, as indicates a flag lot, and this is the primary access to the site, that would be used for vehicle um, entering and exiting the site, as well as providing the emergency vehicle access and um, garbage truck access. So that's kind of our biggest turning radius is, is emergency vehicles and garbage trucks. Uh, they also have an easement that goes across this area, and that's not intended to be used as the primary access for the site, but it can be used as secondary access if needed. Um, so the site, I can get into it more with the landscaping, but it's surrounded um, by stormwater bioretention system. Uh, and then the first floor would primarily be the showroom in this area. This is some service desks. Uh, this is kind of the parts and service area. And then the entire service bay in the rear of the building. And the service department is accessed right through here. There's a roll-up door. And then this is the ramp that would access rooftop parking. And that rooftop parking is only for vehicle storage. It's not intended for any um, customer parking or access. And then getting in just a little more zoomed in vision, version of the floor plan, uh, here's the main entrance with the showroom in this area. Um, and then again, some office area. Uh, and this is where the, the service counters are really handled. The second floor plan has some office space, employee break room, and part storage. And this is the front elevation. And again, given that it's a flag lot, it's really minimally visible from industrial road. I think you're really going to have to take a quick look as you're driving down to get a view of this. But as you enter the site, this is kind of that vantage that's uh, fronting towards industrial road. And here's the main showroom entrance with kind of a decorative tower element, a large glass showroom a decorative canopy across that entrance. And here's then the service area with the roll-up door accessing the service department. And this is the rear elevation that would, you would definitely see along um, Highway 101. Uh, this is, again, a kind of a decorative element in the blue panels. And these windows would be of the, um, the rooftop parking. So they would actually be able to have uh, some vehicle display in there. Probably similar to when you're driving north and you see the Mercedes dealerships kind of has some of the vehicles in the windows. So that would provide some nice um, interest in that facade as it's a rather large uh, facade along Industrial Road. It's got a lot of clean lines, kind of modern look to this building. Uh, there's also some windows here in the showroom to provide some light into, excuse me, service area to provide light into the service area. Uh, the elevation, this would be the front uh, towards Industrial Road and the rear at Highway 101. Um, so there's that front showroom. And then here's the ramp that you see that would go up to uh, the rooftop parking for vehicle storage. And then the other elevation, um, Industrial Road, you see here the pole sign. Um, excuse me, 101 with the pole sign and then Industrial Road with the front of the building. Um, and as I mentioned with the landscaping, under our stormwater requirements, they are required to have on-site retention and treatment of the uh, stormwater. So we have the perimeter bioretention planting um, and then some shade trees throughout the site, as well as some kind of accent planting around um, the entrance to the building. And this plan does comply with the stormwater requirements and also meets our minimum um, landscaping requirement, 10% of the overall site area. Uh, signage, it includes a, approval of the complete sign plan as well as a variance. And the elements of that various request are really that secondary pole sign out on industrial roads. So the code allows one pole sign. And the primary pole sign would be this one at the rear that you see from um, Highway 101. And that does meet our code requirements. The height is 40 feet. And the sign face is 10 by 10. So that complies with the sign ordinance. But that secondary pole sign that would be out on industrial road would be part of the subject of the variance approval. And that's a 13-foot height and a 5 by 5 foot sign face. Um, given the constraints of the site, the limited visibility from industrial, as well as the limited ability to put a monument sign, because monument signs have larger setback requirements than a pole sign, as well as the site visibility when you're traveling north on um, industrial with the, the building next door being rather close to the, to the street frontage, it would be rather difficult to see the monument sign. So given the site restrictions, we are supportive of the variance request. 
Um, they're also requesting some changeable banners, and one would be a larger banner at the rear of the building, and some more decorative banners that are kind of similar to what the city has on our light poles as well as downtown, the flag banners that hang that have some messages that would be changeable. So they would like to put those um, on the interior of the property on their light poles as well as I think five of them at the rear of the building and those may have images that change over time uh, to also provide some interest in the building and break up the mass. Um, and then the overall signage includes all the wall sign, um, the, the pole signs, this emblem and all these identification signs together with those changeable flag banners that I mentioned in the larger display banner at the rear, they're requesting a total sign package of a little over 1,200 square feet when our standard code requires 200 square feet. And as I indicated, this is a rather unique property. Um, it's a very large property, over 2.6 acres. Uh, given the size of the building, I think the signs would fit in well, as well as the banners are really only visible on the poles when you're interior of the property. And given that limited visibility on industrial road and the need for uh, the poll sign. So the staff is supportive of the variance. And as requested by one of our commissioners, thank you very much, uh, the applicant did a quick mock-up so you could see what that poll sign might look like on Industrial Road. And so he's got it there. And as you see, here's the driveway and the site at the back. And this is that building I mentioned next door that's rather close to the, to the street frontage. So that's a mock-up of what that poll sign might look like. Uh, we did prepare an initial study of mitigated negative declaration. We also had Hexagon Transportation Consultants take a look at what the trip generation would be for this project. Um, and we have several mitigation measures relating to air quality and noise, pretty standard mitigation measures during the course of construction. Um, geology and soils, standard again requirement for the soils report to be submitted as part of the building permit submittal process. And then hazard and hazardous materials. Um, there is some really deep and old um, soil contamination in the site from when it was under the Praxair use. Uh, so Praxair is the responsible party. They're working with San Mateo County Health to remediate that. And so the only request now for the applicant is that they cooperate with that process. Um, and they've in detailed discussions with the county. Um, staff has also had those discussions as well to understand what the requirements are. And the county has issued a letter and also verbally told us that um, the building can be constructed as proposed as long as they continue to cooperate with the remediation effort. Um, and then again, standard uh, mitigation measures relating to cultural resources, if anything's found during the course of construction. Um, and as well, Commissioner brought to our attention that uh, unfortunately we had a bit of an oversight with requiring the transportation demand management plan as a part of this project. Um, so we've informed the applicant that that would need to be submitted and turned into um, Planning Commission and staff for review, so we'll need to bring that back to you at a future meeting date. Uh, so we've added this as a condition of approval, um, and I also have a, a copy of it before you. The TDM measure requires a 20% reduction in peak hour trips, and the peak hour trips is 115, so 20% reduction of that. Some examples that we've already discussed with them that they're open to doing is maybe having on-site shower, changing room, maybe adding some um, bike lockers, having a shuttle service, which they do anyway. So I think it'll be very easy for the applicant to implement, and we'll just bring that back to you at, at a future meeting. Uh, so we have a couple of motions for you, the first one relating to the environmental, and the second one I've lumped together all the other entitlements, the design review, grading and dirt hall, variance, use permit. Um, the applicants and the architect are here this evening and be happy to answer any of your questions. Great. Um, does anybody have any questions for Lisa at this um, point? Sorry, I just want to notice, I'm sorry. We did do two different public notices uh, because the item has continued previously. Mm -hmm. I did speak with the adjacent property owner and no concerns addressed. Great, thank you very much. Sorry about that. So the picture you showed of the building facing industrial, that the building isn't on industrial, it's back behind and there's just the access road That's beside, correct? correct? That's correct, okay. yeah. All right. I can go back if you want. How tall is the building in front of it? Uh, I'm not sure the height of that building. Um, it's kind of a tall one story. 12, 15 feet maybe. I think may have a better idea of that, yeah. <laughs> Probably around 15, 15 feet. I think it's about 15, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you will actually see a good portion of this. Building this from building industry. is about yeah 39 it's 40, feet. It's set 40 feet. Really centered on the property, so it does have a lot of large setbacks. Um, so you, as you're driving, you may catch the top of it. Sure. But this on is both a sides, rather low-level building. On both sides, they're very wide driveway 
areas mm -hmm. that you've you shown. Catch a glimpse so of it at those driveways. We'll actually see mm -hmm. a fair amount of it. Um, you're talking about hauling in 380 truckloads of soil. Mm -hmm. um, how much taller will that make the property? Um, it varies, but I believe it's three feet. Yeah. Three feet. Three feet at and, the most. And right. when you're talking 40 feet, are you talking from existing grade or are you talking from the three feet from the increase? From the new grade, yes. From the new grade. Mm -hmm. So it's really going to be 43 feet high compared to the... I think the applicant would like to give a more detailed answer to that question. Okay. Any other questions for Lisa at this point? One more question. Yes. The, the second story, that's all enclosed, so it's not like having, except for what's in the showroom portion of it, there aren't, won't be cars parked on top, will there? It's all, it's enclosed? The story. rooftop parking yeah. would all be screened with the parapet. Okay. Yes. Thank you very Thank much, you. Lisa. Uh, would the applicant like to come forward? Gordon Lestrange with Lionakis Architects, so I'm here to, um, explain a little bit about the project and the logic and concept behind how the building uh, came to be as such on the site since the site conditions are essentially really um, controlling of how we were able to, to adapt the, 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 the footprint onto the site itself. Um, I did want to address just the grading issue initially. Um, basically the, the site slopes from industrial road back to the rear along 101 and I believe there's a, a couple of feet change in elevation from that point back that goes from industrial road in a gradual slope. Basically the drainage is from front to back which we will be maintaining and then we're right raising the site to get us out of the floodplain um, and there will be more grading in the rear than there will be at the front. So um, if I'm going to hazard a guess I would estimate between one and a half to two feet for where the building will sit at the front front portion of the entry as opposed to the rear. And some of that's a bit more evident on the sections in the um, civil drawings uh, in your packet. Thank you. Um, let me just give you a quick overview in the logic. So the flag, the flag lot site that we have, um, I might <coughs> just pop forward to give you the site plan here. Um, uh, essentially the, the building itself is configured to suit both the Honda requirements from the manufacturer and also from the user requirements based on day-to-day -day operations. And what that means is that we've got a, a fairly large service bay, service being the main day-to-day um, uh, -day operations of the business, along with the sales portion which is the showroom component at the front. Um, and that essentially orientated the building as we were making the decision on how to place it on this difficult site. Um, our, our main concern was to be able to service the cars coming in and out at the different times of the day, uh, deal with the evening time uh, truck deliveries that would come in for parts and for cars, and try and um, make it as logical and simple as possible, which ended up making really the only way to orientate the building based on its width being slightly longer than its depth uh, in, in this fashion. Um, the site size while it can accommodate the parking requirements by the city code, really doesn't satisfy the need for inventory parking, which is why we went for the rooftop option. And that way we can use the rooftop for a lot of the flexibility on different times of operations of the month when there's more cars than others, et cetera, and not have to uh, really have an acre of parking around the building. Um, we've used the, these, the drainage requirements, the bioswale type uh, requirements by the city to, to orientate how the grading was going to be done. Uh, we're following the same process now where most of the drainage will go to the rear except we're taking it um, to the sides first for retention and then back to the rear for the stormwater drainage using the same system that exists currently. Um, what that allowed us to do is harness the landscaping requirements and also kind of solve the, the logic of having a, a site where we need to accommodate a lot of cars yet we still need to incorporate all the other requirements typically through planning of city of landscaping, et cetera. Uh, we've been strategic about where we orientate the trees as well based on the requirements of the city. Um, uh, working with um, special tree types that will work in the bioswales 
and then also as you can see on the left side of the plan where we have uh, the customer parking and some of the employee parking where we have uh, kind of centered most of the trees in that location. So that will help mitigate a little bit of that view corridor you're talking about between the two buildings at the front because that will be more of the landscaped area that will be visible. So as you come down industrial and look to your right, you're going to catch the top of the building. You'll see the driveway, then you'll catch the top of the Honda building. You'll see the, the Honda element, which is that barrel. And then as you pass the uh, front parcel building, you're going to catch a lot of the landscaped areas from industrial. And uh, that will help obscure a little bit of the uh, back side of the service bay. You'll still see the building which as you mentioned is going to be 39 feet to the top of the parapet and that would be at the highest point. Um, but I think with that in mind, we've still got a fairly um, uh, uh, compatible way to accommodate that building on such a big, uh, such a big building on a, such a small site. And so I'm available for any more questions. I, I have one quick one. Um, I just want to be clear about the traffic and circulation. So the easement over to the left is not going to be used for regular Traffic circulation, it just seems like it would be a natural. So, so the, the easement on the left is, is a, for benefit of both parties. And it's mainly there for the, for the fire truck circulation requirement. Okay. So we don't have control over that parcel. So we're not really using that as a primary entry or exit because we're not going to be able to control the improvements in the existing asphalt, which is in pretty bad shape. I see. So while we're going to have a curb cut that will allow us to get across the site, we're not necessarily going to be using that as our signage and wayfinding for the operations. So the, the, the main entry coming in, which is at the bottom of the flag, for in and out for customers, and then the, the, the monument signage that will be interior of the site that directs you to, to sales and then service and, and customer parking, et cetera, will all be based on that circular around the building and then back in and out the same way. Will the fence yeah. that um, currently goes across that left driveway remain? Yeah. Um, no, the fence will be removed. The fence will be removed. So there won't be any reason that people can't go out that exactly. driveway. So we're not going to promote it, but it will be available. Okay. We're not going to prohibit it is what I'm getting at. And again, we do require it for fire truck access. Uh, so we couldn't close it if we wanted to. Does anybody else have any other questions for the applicant at this point? Um, I'm not sure if they're for the applicant or the, who they're the for. Flags. How tall are those? And I think that you mentioned that they were. I'm sorry, that they were not visible. Will they be visible by the road? So we've got about 14 light posts, um, which will be on the f uh, on the there's two coming in the flag. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, on the long driveway, and then they'll be um, um, surrounding the both sides of the building. Mm -hmm. So we've identified 14 of them along the face of the building and the two on the uh, driveway portion of the flag. They're going to be about 14 or 15 feet high. We've got, um, they aren't going to be as tall as normal light posts because we can't pollute on either side of our, okay. of our site. So we're working on LED fixtures to get more um, controlled distribution. So we're looking at about a five foot sign that would hang from that and say it's 15 feet for the pole with the sign hanging off about two foot six wide by five feet, kind of a banner. Um, and then uh, again, logic is part of the operations of the facility. The ownership has to participate in the Honda sales events that come along every, every couple of months. And so there's a need for the display and the advertising of that um, within the site itself. So that's the intent of those flags. That way you'll be able to uh, comply with his manufacturer requirements. But 14, 14, 14 of them are facing, are actually like on the 101 side of... Oh, I'm sorry, no. Um, we would have five on 101 only. Five on 101, okay. And there'd be 12 to 14 on the, on the industrial side portion of the site, but only two of them would be actually on the driveway itself. Okay. So m the majority would be inside the site, so you'd see them when you park your car, not necessarily as advertising from industrial. The five facing the freeway would be visible from yeah. the freeway. Okay. The, the pole sign in the, um, along industrial, uh, I mean, along uh, Highway 101, where is that located? Is it um, behind the building or is it that, so, is it way up to the left? On, in, on the um, 101 side, it's on the top right corner. You'll see um, a small keynote in the green landscaped area, the very top corner of the site. 
So the top right hand top corner. Top right hand corner. That would be okay. where the large pole sign would be. The, the 40 foot one. The 40 foot one. Okay. And then the smaller pole sign, if you look down to the very bottom of the flag, there's a rectangle that shows the curb cut being replaced, mm -hmm. the existing one. Just to the north of that is a single keynote that points to a, the pole sign location. This is a little interesting conundrum for us because we didn't have any, because of the nature of the lot, we don't have enough space to put a monument sign with, even within the setback requirements and still maintain an accessible sidewalk and a wide enough drive aisle to meet the fire truck requirements. So Honda requires us to have the front monument sign, so we had to come up with this um, a slightly eclectic approach to satisfy the manufacturer requirements and also meet the city requirements, even with the variance. Any other questions for the applicant at this point? Um, Scott, you mentioned you may have more questions for Lisa or for... Uh, let me ask uh, one more here. Um, the cars on the roof, Will they be visible above the the height of the building? Um, the cars on the very front, at, at the very center apex of the building, where the power pit would be about 42 inches, maybe a little higher, you would potentially be able to see a couple of cars there because the, the, the roof will slope from the center to each end. So on the rear, we've got um, uh, about a 10-foot power pit, which has the windows along the rear from the freeway. And then it will slope back up to the center where the power pit will be lower in relation to the roof height. So as you're standing, if you were standing on elevation looking straight at, at the building, not taking into account any sight lines from the street, you could see the top of the car above that corner power pit. But in general, based on the sight lines from down below, both freeway and from industrial road, you're not going to be able to see that based on the angle. Any other questions for the applicant at this point? Um, well, at this point, I'd like to see, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and we can always call them up if we have any additional questions. But I did want to see if there was anybody here for public comment. Any members of the public wishing to speak on this agenda item? OK, seeing none and having no speaker cards then. Um, are, you, are you guys comfortable closing public comment and deliberating? So, Move to second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Okay. So comments, deliberations at this point? Um, I, I do have a couple of concerns, uh -huh. um, one of which is as you're heading north, uh, actually south, what I consider south on Industrial Road, um, in order to get into this, you're going to have to cross a double line. And you mean on industrial? On industrial. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember if there is a U turn at um, Tanklage, which is where the light is there. And so, how are we going to address the traffic issue? Lisa, is that something that you may know the answer to? Um, I, I don't recall when the next ability is for a U-turn, um, but we did have the traffic engineer, Gary Black, take a look at it, um, and he thought, you know, be able to make the next access, be able to get to the site, and he didn't see an issue with the site circulation. The, the next? I don't recall what the next ability is, but he thought it was yeah. within a reasonable uh, distance to get to the site. You could go down Tanklage and then turn around in one of the businesses there, or you could go all the way down to... Um, uh, Circle Star? Not Circle Star, but Britain would be the next mm -hmm. actual place that you can legally take a U-turn and turn around. So that concerns me that a lot of the individuals who are coming off of Holly Street will actually be making an illegal left-hand turn into the business. So I'd like to see us think about how that's going to be addressed. Um, is it an illegal left-hand turn? Across the double yellow line. And when you're in industrial road, and industrial road is very busy during the peak hours, um, I, I... Yeah. I, I did discuss it with 
Gary Black, and I thought yeah. there was the ability to make the left turn into the site. Um, I, mean, I think he had some concerns in the long term as right. there became more traffic. It may be something for the city to look at for a median or a dedicated left turn lane. But based on the number of tra traffic trips for this project, he didn't see warranting um, any further restrictions of the site, of the circulation patterns at all. I, I think that needs to be addressed somehow, whether we remove the double yellow line to allow an entrance in there or something. Um, but I think we shouldn't necessarily encourage people to break the law in order to get to am one I, of our businesses. Am I wrong, or can you not? Gosh, I you, almost there are breaks to, to make left-hand turns oh. into the breaker? residential streets and the streets on the other side, but there is no break in that region there to be able to make a left-hand turn. I see. And I'm just saying, if we're going to do it, let's restripe out there and remove the double lines so that you can actually get into the business. And the police aren't out there ticketing people who are going into the business. You can, I, that's as long, what I'm as long, to say. As long as it's not it's, an it island, is I think you can. It's unless not an there's island. two double, it, unless it's a, t it's a double, double double, you can turn left onto it. Turn left? Um, Across as long the, as there's no island. My I mean, last traffic I, it's school, been, I think, made that I really keep getting, clear. I, I keep getting <laughs> automatic renewals of my driver's license, so it's been a while since I've studied the, uh, the DMV just, book, but my recollection is that you can make a left-hand turn across a double yellow as yeah, long as there's not an island or a double-double. Okay. Yeah. Now, your okay. concern may still be well-placed right. to the extent that if it's busy, yes. people have to stop in order to make that left-hand turn. I know this. Uh, but I also refuse to accept the premise that our, our fine San Carlins are going to intentionally break the law. <laughs> I refuse to. I refuse no, to. It would be, they wouldn't be, 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 be from San Carlos, yeah. <laughs> I be reject outside that premise. San I'm Carlos. offended by the very suggestion. <laughs> I guess that, no, was, that was my question, A, that it's, it's not illegal to make the turn, and I was pretty sure that was, that was true. But I do think that brings up valid <coughs> circulation issues yeah. around, right. around the lot. Right. And that's, as I indicated, Gary Black, um, I discussed it with him. He's a traffic consultant to reviewed this project, also prepared the general plan. I also talked to Jay Walter, our public works director, and neither one of them felt that any restrictions of a median or no left turn lane were warranted at this time. Okay. Um, let's see, what else do I have? Um, Looks like you have a lot. I do. <laughs> I do. Um, well, does anybody else have any... Um, comments or concerns that they'd like to raise at this point just to spread it around okay then back to just you, me no, okay no, i actually uh, i actually uh, share the concern that you yeah, do because yeah. it's 120 round 20 120 trips on peak hours that's you know if you're if half of them are coming going north that's that's a number of people standing there in the left hand lane turning i mean no left hand lane turning well and regardless of whether yeah I mean, you you could be pausing traffic. I get that concern. And in particular, because there are multiple other places on industrial where people make left-hand turns, and right now, in, in, to get into the sports center that's there, mm -hmm. um, you see a lot of people backing up um, on industrial road. And, and then they go past that, and they start really speeding down industrial road. And if somebody slows down to make another left-hand turn, it's just gonna cascade a little bit. So just something to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the questions I had is, how often are the service entrances open? Are they pretty much open all day long? It's From seven to seven? Hi, I'm David Meese with the ownership group. Um, yes, our service department is open at 7 a.m. and we close at seven. And the, the, the doors are going to be open and they've looked at the noise of the compressors running and the pneumatic tools sure. that, that are going to be. The compressors today actually are very quiet. Very quiet. And they are in a uh, concrete block room. OK. Um, along with uh, other items in that you just want to keep contained. And then the, what you're referring to is the, the air guns that the technicians used. Yes. And so uh, the noise there that they was admit, uh, yeah. Uh, we're, we're dealing with that in the shop. However, what we did with the design was we created a uh, sort of an enclosed environment for the shop. So we only have the, the openings at the far two ends of the building, on the far left and the far right, um, as vehicles can leave the shop or come into for repair by our staff. Our customer entrance comes in from the drive aisle 
there off of industrial and flows in to the right of the pink area designated as the showroom. So it flows in, this will probably work for me here. There we go. So customer entrance is in through here. And at this point, they're in an enclosed canopy all the way into here. And this is all glass and our service advisors are here to be able to move them down and take care of their needs. What about loudspeakers? We would have loudspeakers as we do today, but we don't, we don't use them much um, as far as for external because pretty much all of our business needs is internal. Um, but I know the point because I've been in that environment sometimes you're trying to get people from across the yeah. lot and you can see it, for our use everything's pretty compact. We're, we're dialed in pretty tight here. Question. Uh, no, go thank ahead, you. Uh, can we put a time limit on the use of those speakers? The reason I ask is that the building will actually be higher up than all of the buildings around it, and you are really not that far from a residential neighborhood. And so a business that's not that far away, that it, it is maybe a little bit closer than you, was the in and out Burger. And they actually put restrictions on the speakers um, that uh, are used on in and out uh, at in and out Burger. In fact, at a certain time, and I can't remember whether it's 7 or 8 o'clock, um, they no longer use those speakers. So that, And they've dialed the volume down as much as possible so that it really only hits the area around them and doesn't sort of spill over. It's the same theory as the light. Sure. Okay. What, what does a car dealer use speakers for anyway? And I mean, this cars is ready, that yeah. kind of thing. Really? You, have you ever, yeah, been in a dealership where they they're on a loudspeaker trying to get a hold of somebody or? No. I mean, I was just thinking this is right by the highway. I mean, how loud can these speakers really be? <laughs> I mean, they're really gonna they're really gonna be that much louder than the highway noise? You, you would thought in and out Burger wouldn't have been a big deal, but yeah, it was. Right. Um. So, so are you are you the uh, are you the Dave of David's office? Of David's office. Yeah, David's office is actually labeled on this, and I thought, wow. Oh yes, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and is Chris here too? That's Chris. Chris. <laughs> and I noticed that Chris and David's offices are exactly exactly the same size. At is there the like moment. is There's there some like pushing and pulling <laughs> going on there? Um, and another. Can we add a condition where Dave's office is bigger than Chris's I actually office? was going to have Chris. I'm trying to start something, aren't you? Like one foot larger than, Dave, <laughs> than Dave's office. Oh. Um, another, um, another question that is not going to reflect, uh, affect my vote at all. Um, is, is the Honda dealership in Redwood City going to close down and this is going to be a replacement for it? That's correct. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I do um, have a question then, uh, just in relation to sound. Um, so, Commissioner Marsters, were you then interested in limiting the the noise just for the service department hours, which are more more constricted than the sales hours. Is that what you're looking to do? I was actually going to constrict it to nine to seven, so it would open. It would be allowed when the the. the I see what you mean. I'm trying to get away from the early and the late evening, the early morning and the late evening. Okay. And I figure most of the speakers are going to be used during the day to let people. T okay. Um, then I guess uh, for because we're drawing a parallel between In and Out Burger, was this a condition that was put on put on there? And do you have some wording in mind? Um, I, I I don't. I know that actually in. I'm not sure whether it was put on a, as a condition on in and out Burger or whether it was something that the neighborhood negotiated with in and out Burger. Um, maybe Mr. Save could. Well, first, does that matter? Do you care, um, Dave? Does it matter? Do you have a particular time that you need to use the speakers? Does it? I think what we find ourselves using them for is at times paging for a phone call. Right. In our service use, we use two-way radios. Oh. So when a customer's arrived to pick up their car, the receptionist or cashier calls on the two-way radio, and the porters go and grab that car by its tag number. 
um, our paging already is at our business is pretty minimal because we just we know what that's like in an environment when you're at a business and they're paging over this noise box. We also have the benefit of starting from scratch here. So we certainly are interested in working within a community because that's how we live our, our daily lives. And starting from scratch, we can probably apply some solutions that aren't normally available. Uh, one of them would be, you know, we're running everything from scratch to these light poles. We can run speaker wire to these light poles. They can be very minimal, you know, broadcast and in enough locations that it gets the job done without having, you know, a big PA system trying to cover a broad area. Oriented in such a way that they exactly face internally oriented exactly, as opposed to facing out facing right. out right. Okay. Um, Al, did I, you have an additional comment? I know you're leaning towards the mic. Yeah, I, I remember the noise being an issue after the in and out went into operation, and they did turn down the volume. I can't remember if we had a condition. Yeah. But the, it is common to have conditions, especially for fast food, because they tend to be located near residential. Um, so it is typical to do that for, for those types of uses. Okay, great. And that would be something we could word appropriately to make the speaker space yeah. internal. Okay, gotcha. terrific. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry, before I, I let you sit down. I do. That's <laughs> or, okay. Are you um, comments? Dirt hauling on Saturday and Sunday? Are, is there a way we can limit the dirt hauling so that it doesn't occur on Saturdays and Sundays? I wouldn't see a problem with that. I would doubt they'd want to work that on Saturday okay. and Sunday. So, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to think of things that will keep a little bit of peace. Yeah. Um, okay. And the last thing I have is sort of a discussion amongst the uh, planning commissioners. Okay. Um, so um, for the sign ordinance, they're asking for a variance from 200 square feet to 1,200 square feet. It's a very significant um, increase. And while I'm sort of leaning towards granting it, um, I would like to see their sort of be some compensation or some trade-off, shall we say, in order to do that. And, and for me, that trade-off is trees, landscaping, and looking for additional places for trees to be located and, and without interfering with the um, marketing um, of, or the advertisement of the um, uh, interfering with the advertisements, the, the signs and things. Okay. So, so I'm, have, I'm can, I, just, can I can I ask? I'm just kind of curious. Sure. Are any of these signs visible from? I, I was under the impression that almost all of these signs were basically just visible from the dealership itself other than the sign that's visible from the freeway and the sign that's visible from industrial. Are any of the other signs visible from the street or the highway? You'd have a very difficult time snapping your neck over and making out what these are. As described, they're 30 inches, 2 feet 6 by 5 feet. And the main inches. purpose of these signs are just to meet dealership requirements, basically? They, they reinforce the sale message of the periodic sales that the manufacturer have. You know, so, our, our merchandising area is outdoors. Okay. Right? We, we can't put everything inside in the shelf or in the showroom. So um, consumers tend to feel more comfortable and more apt to purchase mm -hmm. if they recognize that they've come to the right place at the right time. Uh -huh. And so the merchandising effort that's put on by the manufacturers, both in television, broadcast, and web, needs to be reinforced at the facility. And so that's what these do. Um, so. We're talking about the sight lines that are available from industrial past the existing building and the gap that it has today. Who knows what that might be in the future. It might be a bigger, wider building. We don't know. Um, but yes, the intent is not for these banners, if you will, attached to our light poles. The intent is not for them to somehow broadcast or carry a message out to people driving on industrial. We have no vision nor expectation that they'll do that. They are for when people enter the lot and are walking through our lot looking at the merchandise that they're reminded of, oh, yes, I saw some ad. Oh, yes, it's that time of year. Oh, yes, it's that sale right now. That's what they're for. Are these the um, little yellow squares on um, sheet L1? Are those the poles? 
네. Which sheet are you referring to? Yeah, this, they, are, they are. They are the parking lot light. Right, we're looking at this one here. Oh yes, the landscape plan. Yeah. I mean, I have to say that that looks like a decent amount of landscape for the use. Yeah, we we do have a bit of a restriction as well that um, we're using the majority of the landscape as bioswales for the filtering of the storm water. Right, that's fine. So we do have a restriction on the type of planting that we can put in those bioswales. And so a number of the trees that are on the right side, on the right side of the plan already are uh, trees that are, are able to um, uh, thrive in those in those environments. But the trees do interfere in the ability for the drainage to occur back down the site to the rear. Okay. So um, we we were we were trying to accommodate the minimum required amount of trees by the zoning code based on the size of the site and the amount of parking, and additionally meet the stormwater requirements, and that did not have a lot of wiggle room. I see. And I have to say, I, I, I do think it looks adequate for, for the use. The 24 trees, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that looks like a lot of more trees than I've seen on a lot. But, um, but I do appreciate your point. Thank you very much. I do and, appreciate the And also, don't forget, strategy. Chris also has his putting green right here. Yeah, the putting green. Chris's putting green. No, it's artificial. Oh, it's artificial. Let's not Maybe we can that require today. that that be uh, actual grass. I'd just like to know how you knew it was Chris's putting green. Uh. <laughs> He's got a. So, it, it is a significant sign variance, though. I understand what you, what you mean. I'm, I'm, but I just don't think this is the sign. It's, it's, well, I'm, I'm thinking creatively here. Okay. And um, thinking that there's the potential for um, either uh, uh, rooftop trees in pots, or are there the ability to put trees along the um, driveway? Um, because most of the trees are all in uh, in the back there. Right. I'm just, uh, to me, that's that's an, a, a very large amount of signage. And while I think that that that's part of that comes along with the 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 business, right. um, I and I don't I don't really have a, a a huge problem when I think of banners. I think of those flags. Right. Um, what I'm worried about is are there long banners that are on the tops or the sides of the building that are hanging down. Um, I'm not sure when you talk about banners, are you just talking flag banners? Um, in the variance, we've uh, called out the flag banners that we spoke about earlier. Yeah. And then we have one large banner on the back side of the building facing 101. Right. Right. And that's, that's pretty much a permanent but changeable banner. Exactly, because there's always okay. a different seasonal sale message. And, and so that's that's going to be a very large banner. It is, on the back side of the building facing 101. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to see if there's any wiggle room here for some additional landscaping to sort of offset um, the variance for... Um, May I ask, is your concern more um, aesthetic for this particular, for this particular lot, or um, I guess I guess what I'm asking is, would adding a couple of additional potted trees on the top of a roof that we can't really see add much to the visual quality of this project? And that I just don't know yeah. if it will. In all honesty, yeah. I guess that's kind of yeah. my yeah. I'm going to treat that as a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> thanks, thanks, David. No, but I, 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 mean, I, I you, you know, Mar Scott, I love trees. I'm just looking. There's no point. place to put oh, any more trees on this property. Um, I mean, I, I, the driveway. Um, I mean, I, I'm thinking you're going to want cars to get get. But I mean, I, no, no. I just don't. I don't see any room for trees. Yeah. And I, I love trees. Well, remember, <laughs> the, the, the trunk of the tree is not that wide. And Jesse, you're about to say something. Yeah, I just I think that uh, I mean I think there's a lot of 
trees here actually are ready for, for the, the parcel itself. I mean, it, it's a large parcel and uh, it, um, I think putting trees on top of the second story parking deck, I'm not even seeing trees from 101. <laughs> yeah, you're worried except, about that. Except that I don't think we would actually see it, given yeah. how given okay. how I understand the lot. Yeah, no, I understand. It's a great idea. Um, is there any other any other comments, concerns, or questions about uh, about the project at this point? Okay. Well, hearing and seeing nothing, then. Um, Lisa, would this be an appropriate point to put those motions up and see if see if we're ready to do that? <laughs> I got them. You got them. I move that the Planning Commission adopt the accompanying resolution for approval of the proposed mitiga mitigated negative declaration associated with the proposed development of a new automobile sales and service facility at 775 Industrial Road based on the findings and for the reasons incorporated in the prepared initial study mitigated negative declaration and staff report. May I get a second, please? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. I move that the Planning Commission approve the design review grading and dirt hall certificate variance and conditional use permit associated with the proposed development of a new automobile sales and service facility at 775 Industrial Road based on the findings and for the reasons incorporated in the staff report and as conditioned in the conditional use permit variance and design review certificate and grading and dirt hall certificate. Um, I'm sorry, really quickly, I want to make sure, do we need to do anything special to add condition 15? And, yes. And do you want to put the two condi additional conditions in? Oh, um, with the uh, addition of condition um, 15 um, and the condition that uh, dirt hauling not occur uh, during the weekends and the condition that, uh, that the applicant work with staff to uh, ameliorate any amplified, amplified sound um, caused by the, the speakers proposed. Second. Great. And then Is that the additional one? Oh, he said that. Oh. He said Commission 15. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? No? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, reports, correspondence, and general information. A report on recent city council actions. Um, I would just like to report back to the commission um, that the city council um, did approve the authorization of the Mills Act that was forward to, forwarded to them for the um, property at 40 Pine Avenue. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's known, but I don't think we've met since um, our last meeting on the, um, on the 18th. And so as you probably know by now, the City Council did approve the plan development plan for the Transit Village with modifications, um, reducing the or removing the four-story element and a couple of other conditions, as you might have heard of. Um, and those are all the items that I have for recent City Council actions. Thank you. City Council authorized the purchase of three properties known as the landmark site, 595 Industrial, 850 East San Carlos Avenue, and 810 East San Carlos Avenue. So we are in escrow on those three properties right now. Um, we're working on our due diligence, so we're doing a phase one environmental and ALTA survey as well as getting gathering information on all the tenants at the site. Um, staff is also working on a request for proposal for hotel developers. We met with the Economic Development Subcommittee of the Council to review that, and that'll go back to the City Council at their first meeting in January, and then we would release that uh, proposal for developers, review those proposals, and bring them back to the City Council for their consideration. Do you have any yeah. questions? Um, the City Council also approved the lease agreement and the relocation agreement for the Clear Channel billboard at 800 Bramston. Thank you. Okay, um, lots going on. Any planning commission comments or reports? No? Okay, correspondence. 
I don't see any additional correspondence. That's correct, Chair. Okay, thank thank you. you. And then finally, planning staff comments, reports, and updates of current projects. Yes, we actually do have a couple of announcements. Um, the first announcement that I would like to make is that the City uh, Hall will be closed um, beginning Tuesday, December 24th through uh, January 1st. And we will reopen on Thursday, January 2nd. The other announcement I would like to make is that um, the Community Development Department will be moving temporarily and have a uh, new location, a temporary location over at the library. Um, we will be, there, the area here on the first floor will be undergoing um, a remodel. There will be a new planning counter which will create more visibility and greater uh, customer service, enhanced customer service operations um, for the department. And um, so beginning on January 2nd, we will be located inside the library. So the planning um, permit counter as well will be relocated on the second floor of the library next door. And I provided um, a little flyer on the dais for all of you, so you have that information as well. Um, and then um, for the um, first meeting of the year, which will be on January 6th, um, it looks like we, we were we might have been able to cancel it, but we did receive an appeal application of a previous RDRC decision for the property at 1937 Eaton Avenue. And um, because of the closure of City Hall, we're actually going to be providing the packet to the Commission earlier. So that should be available at the end of this week. You'll receive an email notification letting you know when that packet is available. So um, that's the one item that we will start the new year off of. Um, I don't have anything else unless Al or Lisa. Other than that, just happy holidays and have a great new year. Great. Thank you, everybody. Well, Thank uh, you. that's the end. I adjourn this meeting at 8.31. Happy holidays.